My name is Dr John Kenyon, a former member of staff at the National Museum of Wales. Um, I'm here to talk about um, Raglan Castle. Um, I'm a member of the Mortimer History Society, so I've been here on the conferences a few times. Raglan is one of my favourite castles in, in Monmouthshire in South East Wales. It's one of the grandest late medieval buildings you'll find anywhere in the United Kingdom, built by up-and-coming rising Welsh gentry. I'm very proud of their, their Welsh heritage, but unfortunately all that came to an end in 1469 when the Earl of Pembroke was executed. But we go on and look at the history of the castle um, when it was taken over by the, the Earls of Earls of Worcester, they who later became Dukes of Beaufort, who now own the site, um, and we run through until the Civil War siege of 1646, which saw the end of Raglan's life. And I, I also make a few suggestions at the end where we need to further study Raglan Castle, hopefully leading to another conference somewhere and possibly a collection of essays um, to give true value to this amazing site. When in the late 1950s I was at a prep school in the northwest of this county overlooking the historic village of Wrighton of the Eleven Towns, my maternal grandfather took me out one weekend and gave me the beginning of a collection of a new Britain Swap It toys, Swap It Knights, and you won't be able to necessarily see this, fighting the Wars of the Roses, um, with their interchangeable uh, weaponry, heads, bodies, and heraldic, etc. I, I must emphasize that these don't stem from the 1950s. I did acquire these on eBay a, a few years ago. I do not know if it was because the Kenyan family's antecedents lay in Lancashire in the northwest before moving into Shropshire, but it was the Red Rose of Lancashire that I favoured. However, in more recent times, just hold on, <laughs> and especially since I married a Yorkie as well, however, in, in more recent times, with my castle's hat, um, studies hat on, it is the Yorkist side of things that have held my interest, with Raglan, of course, and writing the guidebook for English heritage for the North Yorkshire Castle of Midland. I even joined the Richard III Society with its excellent journal when studying Midland, although I remain ambivalent to that king himself, especially regarding his uh, judicial, judicial murder of my castle hero, William Lord Hastings. And of course, the Mortimer History Society has that Yorkist connection following the death of the last male Mortimer in 1425. Anyway, after that diversion, let us proceed uh, to Raglan. The first edition of Caddo's Guidebook to Raglan Castle was published in 1988. Originally, it was to be a joint effort between the late Dr. Arnold Taylor, you'll see on the left of this slide here, um, the author of the first ministry guidebook in 1950. But in the end, Arnold decided to let me get on with it in the light of Cadu's new format. A revised edition appeared in 1994, and in 2003, a further edition was published in the current larger format. I must make it quite clear in this paper that I remain firmly in the Taylor camp regarding the origin of the Great Tower, or Yellow Tower of Gwent, of which more later, rather than supporting the Anthony Emery theory. I know some at Cadu favour Emery and the architectural historian John Goodall in his majestic tome, The English Castle, 1066 to 1650, saw the towers dating to the later 1460s, probably, and I quote that last word. I should explain that in 1975, Anthony Emery wrote a paper in the archaeological journal for that year suggesting that virtually the whole of Raglan Castle was built by William Herbert, um, the son of William Matt Thomas. But either way, whatever theory you, you want to follow, you're only talking about a few years' difference between the two phases. Nevertheless, I, along with others independently, have been having second thoughts about some aspects of Raglan, notably the moat walk, although these, these thoughts do not appear in the two Cadu guidebooks of the castle, that is, the main booklet, and the pamphlet guide that appeared in 2016. Some of these new thoughts did appear in the first of the late medieval tower conferences that originated in the University of Stirling, initiated by Professor Richard Oram. And further, further thoughts have been sitting in a short paper in a still unpublished festive honoring an Irish scholar to be published by Wordwell. The magnificent remains of the castle, one of the finest late medieval secular buildings in Britain and Ireland, have long attracted attention, 
especially from the time of the development of the Y Valley Tour in the later 18th century. Visits to the castle were enhanced by the publication of a guide to Raglan by the Monmouth printer and publisher Charles Heath, a guide that ran through a number of editions. And descriptions appear in one of Francis Gross's volumes on the antiquities of England and Wales, published from the 1770s onwards. And of course, in William Cox's An Historical Tour Through Monmouthshire, published in 1801. In 1826, W.A. Brooks described Raglan for his folio work examining castellated monastic and domestic architecture, whilst the Pugins also covered the castle in their example of Gothic architecture published in the 1830s with highly detailed drawings of the remains. The writer and publisher on architecture, John Henry Parker, described the ruins in 1859 as more of a military than domestic character but still clearly inhabited as a nobleman's mansion, and went on to compare Raglan with the Duke of Buckingham's great unfinished mansion of Thornbury in the adjacent county of Gloucestershire. The great Victorian castleologist G.T. Clarke seems to have avoided Raglan, and the books of British castles published in the early 20th century there are either passing mentions or no mention of Raglan at all. One of the volumes of Joseph Bradley's History of the County covered the Hundred of Raglan, published in 1911, and a guidebook appeared in 1917, compiled by Rag Raglan Somerset, Warden of the Castle. Nor should we, should we forget the work of contemporary Welsh bards in their praise poems, honouring the Herberts in the 15th century. And of course, Thomas Churchyard's The Worthiness of Wales, which describes Ludlow so well, that appeared in 1587, all of which all these, the poems and churchyard, shed light on Raglan before its destruction in 1646. The Duke of Beaufort, residing at Babington, placed Raglan in the care of the Ministry of Works in 1938, and the work on the conservation of the site continued after the appearance of the 1950 guidebook. This work involved a certain amount of restoration. <coughs> For example, in order to prevent the collapse of the Great Tower, a section had to be rebuilt. Which is this section here. Um, as the monochrome of Plate 2 in Taylor's Guide makes abundantly clear, the original source of the stone having been identified by Frederick North, Keeper of Geology at the National Museum of Wales. In fact, when we were going round Raglan with Arnold Taylor, um, it was apparent that uh, no one had really realised that this part of the tower had been rebuilt to prevent its collapse. So if you look hard at the masonry, you can see it had been. It wasn't until um, Arnold Taylor pointed that to it that we all realised um, that that was the case. Raglan also merits one of the longest entries of any castle in Britain in the County Pevsner series with John Newman's coverage of Mumbershire that was published in the year 2000. What follows is a mere summary of how Raglan developed as understood today, or as I mentioned before, as I understand it. For anyone present who is not familiar with the ownership of the castle, I offer this brief summary. Whether or not the 15th century castle sits on the site of a modern bailey is not clear, but not an unreasonable theory um, in the light of the position of the Great Tower and the castle as a whole, sitting at the intersection of major roads within the Lordship of Usk. Following a grant from Earl Richard de Clare in the winter of 1171-72, the Villa Raglan came into the possession of the Blewett or Blewett family, namely Walter, and it remained in Blewett hands until the late 14th century when it passed to Sir James Barclay through his marriage to the Blewett heiress Elizabeth. Elizabeth's second husband was William Ap Thomas, the younger son of Welsh gentry family, and following her death, William married Gladys, the daughter of David Gann, who fell at Agincourt, and by 1432, through his position in South Wales society and his accrued wealth, he was able to purchase the manor of Raglan from the Barclay family for a thousand marks, one mark being the equivalent of 13 shillings and fourpence. Sir William died in 1445, and his eldest son, William Herbert, succeeded. A prominent supporter of King Edward IV, he housed the youthful Henry Tudor at Raglan, he was created a Knight of the Garter in 1462, and in 1465, Raglan became the centre of its own lordship, the last of the marcher lordships to be established. Herbert became Earl of Pembroke in 1468, 
the first member of the Welsh gentry to enter the English peerage. But he suffered the fate of many a member of the nobility during the Wars of the Roses, when a largely Welsh army was defeated at the Battle of Edgecote or Banbury in 1469, defeated by Richard Neville, the Earl of Warwick. And following their capture, William and his brother Richard were executed. The Earl was buried in Tinton Abbey, his remains of the tomb no longer stand, Richard in the Benedictine Priory Church of St Mary's Abergavenny, which you see here. Raglan eventually came into the possession of the Somerset family, Earls of Worcester. Sir Charles Somerset, the first Earl, married Elizabeth's daughter, William Herbert, the Earl of Huntington, the son of the Pembroke Earl. The transformation of Raglan into a great country house largely occurred in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, through the third and fourth Earls, and it is the Somerset family as Dukes of Beaufort who still own the castle to this day. So what was standing when William Ap Thomas became tenant and then owner of Raglan? The existence of a small number of later 13th century Wessex type tiles from floor tiles from Raglan suggests that the chapel stood somewhere and an account roll of 1375-76 mentions repairs undertaken on a chamber and hall at Raglan as well as to the latrine door of the Lord's Chamber. The castle or manor also had a park associated with it and there's mention of a mill and a pond. Also, it may be that the blocked windows in the Great Hall date to the Blewett period. There's also the matter of the door at the day's end of the hall, blocked by Ashler, bearing mason's marks, clearly of the 15th century. So the castle of William Ap Thomas. Leaving aside the matter of the origins of the Great Hall, the main work assigned to William Ap Thomas is the south gate and the hexagonal yellow tower of Gwent, um, which overlooks it. The gate being the main approach to the castle from the village. This is a plain rectangular building with a portcullis, but originally the entrance passage had a fan vault, um, traces of which remain, and off to one side was a porter's room with fireplace as well as a stair to the upper room and roof. The gate must have led into some form of enclosure that was standing already, an aspect of the castle's development like the hall that require further study. A poem of around 1440 by the Welsh poet Gittor Glyn um, praises William and refers to, um, in Dr Barry Lewis's translation, your enclosure, see here the spotless buildings of your fair stone court at Raglan. Two sources attribute the great tower to Ap Thomas. These are the poem in praise of William Ap Thomas by Gittor Glyn just mentioned, and a family chronicle of the later 17th century. The poem mentions, in translation, the tower which stands above all other buildings. Sir Thomas Herbert of Tinton, his book Herbertorum Prosapia, held in Cardiff's Central Library, mentions that William Ap Thomas had erected a tower of great breadth and height, proportionable of several equilateral sides and angles. This was named Sir William Thomas, his tower, so, i.e. William Ap Thomas, not William Herbert. The tower stands in its own moat, possibly on the side of a mot, and consists today of three floors over a basement kitchen, the uppermost or fourth floor and the battlements having been slighted after the 1646 siege. An entrance lobby leads to a fine staircase down to the kitchen and up to the main rooms. Through the lobby, in what has been described as the great chamber, hall or main living room, but perhaps best seen as a reception area, with windows not as elaborate as the upper floors. At all levels, there were fireplaces and latrines. To some extent, William Ap Thomas has been overshadowed by his son, the Earl of Pembroke, but the position or offices that he held and the wealth that he accrued is signified by the superb tomb with the effigies of him and Goladis in Abergavenny. Originally, with the finest of canopies, as well as his work at Raglan, assuming, of course, that the construction of the tomb was down to him rather than his son. And to the right is the um, tomb of Alice. It just shows the canopies in a better condition than, than those which survive um, to the left at, um, at Abergavenny. But still, um, a magnificent tomb, one of the finest collection of, of alabaster tombs um, you'll see in, in Wales, let alone England. John Goodall, in his major study of the English castle, 
would rather see the source of inspiration for Raglan's Tower lying in England um, with Guy's Tower um, at Warwick Castle, completed in the 1390s. However, for the moment, I still see parallels with buildings in France, uh, such as La Jouet, uh, with the tall Delvin, and the use, albeit a strange one, of the double bascule drawbridge at, at Raglan. So you'll see here um, the, the, the vertical slots for a double bascule drawbridge, i.e. two arms supporting the main drawbridge, and a single arm bascule here, and here in Chris Jones Jenkins' reconstruction to see how it, how it should, should work. Um, but if you go to um, the best examples of bascule drawbridges, particularly in, in France, you'll see that the double bascule tends to be used at the entrance to the castle or the town, and when it comes to the main tower or keep, you've got the single arm bascule. So it, it may be that William Mac Thomas, when he was in France, saw the idea of the bascule drawbridge, rather like the look of them, and um, decided to build one, this great tower at, at Raglan. But it's totally unnecessary to have a, a double bascule drawbridge, usually used for um, men on horseback and wagons, etc. Um, all that's really needed is a single arm bascule drawbridge um, to get into Raglan's tower. The service of father and son in France needs further exploration, and especially in the light of Dr. Adam Chapman's work on the Welsh who may have served on the continent or who may not have done during the Hundred Years' War. However, it is known that William Thomas was with the Duke of York in 1441, and that his son was also in France in the later 1440s. William Herbert was captured at the Battle of Formigny in 1450, but must have been ransomed soon after, as he was with York in the West Country in 1451. To turn to the castle of Sir William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke. We do not know whether Sir William Herbert continued to the letter the plans his father presumably had for the rebuilding of Raglan, but the majestic architecture that we see today owes much to him. We have the great gatehouse and the buildings surrounding the fountain court, towers surmounted by machicolations, gargoyles and grotesques, bearing the influence of works in southwest England, as the late um, Richard Morris has suggested. The 17th century Herbertorium Prosapia mentions that by his father's great tower, William Herbert builds from the ground a very noble castle of well-polished stone about a large court, the structure for beauty and elegancy superior to any other in South Wales, though not so large till the succeeding earls enlarged it, i.e. the Somersets. This noble pile had the arms of the family very curiously cut in shields of stone. The gatehouse, coupled with the closet tower to its right, create one of the most imposing frontages um, of a late medieval building, as imposing almost so as the unfinished work of La Ferdi Mion in France, left incomplete following the assassination of Louis Duc d'Orléans in 1407. The gatehouse and the closet tower, uh, which we see in the left-hand slide, um, have three floors over a basement, Portal gun ports, probably more for effect than practical, are arrayed at, arrayed at ground level, and there are a further set of gun ports at basement level by the gatehouse, but more of these openings later. The gatehouse passage was originally entered via a drawbridge, and then there were three sets of doors and two portcullises, with a doorway on either side into the rooms off the passage. The final doorway in the passage opened into the pitchstone court, so called for obvious reasons. <coughs> The cobbling being Elizabethan, but set over 15th century um, cobbling and when the castle was partially excavated during the conservation in the 40s and 50s. Although severely altered in the late 16th century, the rear of the gatehouse range has enough of the decorative masonry surviving to understand how magnificent this chamber or gallery was, perhaps um, housing Lord Herbert's extensive library. The ranges framing the two long sides of the pitchstone court are the hall, transformed by the Somerset family, and the remains of the office wing with its fireplaces and ovens, and no doubt housing the domestic staff at upper levels. The surviving outer wall also dates from the Somerset period in the 16th century, but the inner and outer walls of this work 
were built slightly beyond the line of the original 15th century office wing. This meant that one wall above the closet and the kitchen towers that were originally external were brought within the Somerset range. The kitchen tower is what survives of Herbert's service facilities. The ground floor contains two large fireplaces, drains and a servery hatch. And the cellar was the wet larder, so named in a late 17th century document that described the domestic arrangements around the time of the Civil War, the 1640s. The upper floor of the kitchen tower contained two fine chambers with fireplaces and with windows on a par with those fine examples in the fountain court to maintain the grand effect that the all-round external appearance of the castle was designed to give. A passage led from the kitchen tower of which was the larder, but most of the work here dates to the late 16th century. Running from the western side of the great gatehouse were Herbert's private apartments um, running through to his father's south gate. To slightly digress for one moment, one of the Carr family badges on the external face of the private chambers has been interpreted in the past as representation of a bascule drawbridge or its counterpoise, such as in Arnold Taylor's guidebook. And we're looking at, oops, sorry, the badge there. More recently, others have proposed that the badge represents a mantlet, a protective cover for gunners and archers, and Professor Matthew Strickland has commented that a number of noble families in the 15th century adopted ordnance-related badges. So you can see here uh, examples of mantlets. Michael Siddons, the former Wales Herald extraordinary and author of the multi-volume work on heraldry in, in Wales, was convinced that the badge represents part of a bascule bridge, the counterpoise section. This was in our correspondence back, as far back as 2005. I must admit that looking at the counterpoise of an existing bascule bridge and examining the badge on the entry to the Beaufort Chapel in St George's Chapel, Windsor, one can see that the interpretation by Taylor and Siddons may be the correct one, although using the counterpoise part of the bascule as a badge is somewhat odd. Framing the fountain court, the fountain itself probably Elizabethan work, were ranges of apartments, each room having a fireplace and a window. One small survivor shown earlier provides a clear picture of the beauty of the windows that lit these ranges. Two sets of apartments were divided by the grand stair, the recent conservation and repair of which was down to the late Turner of Cannon, and the rear of it was provided with latrines, with a further latrine turret nearer the south gate. On the opposite side of the court lay Herbert's new chapel, built against the western wall of the hall, only the foundations um, survive together with evidence for its vaulting. So did the Earl complete Raglan before his death or execution in 1469? Much of the masonry between the kitchen tower and the fountain court apartments belonged to the Somerset phase, but that's, that does not necessarily mean that there was a building hiatus from 1469 to the early 16th century. In the early 2000s, Rick had commissioned Stephen Priestley to trawl through the documentary evidence for Raglan. An account of 1469-70 mentions the delivery of hooks and bars for windows, as well as chandeliers. And there's also reference made to the new work that was last made. Minor repairs were made in the 1480s, including defects in the hall and great chamber. These repairs were financed from the manor of Raglan and detailed in the receiver's accounts. There's no evidence that has come to light that implies Raglan was left unfinished in 1469. Priestley suggested that the lack of evidence in the accounts for the great programme of work at Raglan is because it was financed directly from the household revenues of the father and son, rather than manorial income. Moving on to the country house phase of the Somerset family, so what we see today of the works of the Earl of Worcester is that built by William, who died in 1589, and Edward IV Earl in 1628, died in 1628, as well as the accompanying gardens that have been described by the garden historian Liz Whittle. However, we know from the work of John Morden Guy that an elaborate frieze um, of the early 16th century, now in a private house, existed somewhere in the castle with the initials EW, presumably Elizabeth Worcester, nay Herbert, the wife of Charles, the first Earl of Worcester, who died in 1526. Whether this frieze was in the hall or perhaps removed during the third Earl's rebuilding or elsewhere in the castle is not known made a reappearance in the hall in the 1820s 
when the Duke of Beaufort covered the hall temporarily. A surviving fragment of panelling is also of this date and is on display in the visitor centre at the castle. Raglan became the main country house of the Somerset family, the rural retreat from their London home, Worcester House on the Strand. An inventory of Worcester House when it was seized in 1643 by Parliament gives an indication of how the furnishing of Raglan would have looked. The arms of the third earl as a knight of the garter at the dais end of the great hall imply that Earl William rebuilt the hall after 1570 with his hammer beam roof. A manuscript in the College of Arms in London depicts the heraldic stained glass to be seen in the hall, as well as at Chepstow Castle. At the same time, the gatehouse range was heightened to provide additional accommodation for the household. The office wing was rebuilt, the existing buttery and pantry added, with further accommodation above, as indicated by the fine fireplaces, some of which in bar stone. A long gallery was added with a new staircase to provide access, the gallery running the length of the eastern side of the fountain court. Its fireplace modelled on an illustration in Hugues Sambin's La Diversité des Termes of 1572. <coughs> the parlour with the dining room above lay at the southern end of the hall range and would have been panelled, and a ch carved chimney piece existed in a room at Babington House may have come from one of these rooms, but I believe it has since been dismantled and stored in an attic in Badminton House. But a view of Hardwick's long gallery and chambers gives some idea um, of what Raglan would have looked like, could have looked like. The Great Tower was not ignored by the Earls of Worcester, as indicated by the brickwork in one of the windows, and we know that the tower chambers were amongst the favourite rooms of Henry Somerset, who died in 1646, the fifth Earl and first Marquis, depending on how one interprets Chaplin Bailey's comments about the tower. It may be that in this phase, the original entrance arrangements to the Great Tower were abandoned, including the bascules, the smaller entrance being infilled by a brick fireplace when a full building was added to the tower. And perhaps a double-decker fixed bridge was built linking the main apartments to the quay, as well as creating the turreted inner moat walk, the key to the tower, and the key to the tower seems to be in the personal possession of the 5th Earl in the 1640s, because it was to him that King Charles went um, when he was residing at Raglan during the Civil War uh, for a short period when he wanted to explore the Great Tower. The new gates, the red and white gates, and the gardens and immediate landscape were the work of the 4th Earl in particular, and they made Raglan one of the greatest houses of the late Elizabethan and Jacobean eras. I'll end with just some brief comments on an aspect of the defences and siege of 1646. Uh, before making some comment on the future. Over 30 circular openings for small cannon and handguns uh, exist in, in various walls. Others have been lost. In one brief visit many years ago, when I was able to clamber into the basement area of the Great Gate, I could not see how a gunner could access, access the loops there without a Meccano set of timber decking. The gun ports were seen to be positioned to impress the outsider with Raglan's potential defences for the simple round hole is a somewhat impractical gun opening, even as some are beneath windows. How a team with even a small cannon or handgun could have operated in the wet lard of the kitchen tower is hard to see. Yet the array is impressive, even if the embrasures are set into fireplaces of the private apartments and kitchens. The late Andrew Saunders, Chief Inspector of Ancient Monuments in England, and I always differed on the capabilities of Ragland's gun ports, but I still stick to my guns regarding their usefulness or lack of it, if you'll excuse the pun. But then any opening could be used by people with guns, and in one of the letters of Margaret Paston in 1448, she mentions that men who had seized the Paston Manor of Gresham in Norfolk had, and I quote, made great ordnance within the house, and the holes that be made for handguns, they be scarce knee high from the floor, of such holes be made five. The downfall of the castle came with the arrival of a contingent of the New Model Army under Thomas Fairfax in the summer of 1646, following the capture of Oxford. The account of the siege is well known from various tracts in the Thomason collection in the British Library and elsewhere, and also from the account led by, left by Fairfax's chaplain, Joshua Sprigg, in his Anglia Rediviva, or England's Recovery, published in 1646-7. 
The besiegers set to work in June and July under Colonel Thomas Morgan and the engineer in charge, Captain John Hooper, with Fairfax arriving in August to undertake surrender negotiations. The formal surrender took place on the 19th of August. Um, on the 19th of August. Um, this is the, um, the gun, the mortar made for the siege of, of Goodrich Castle. It's on display in Goodrich Castle, um, but it was also taken from Goodrich then to help with the siege of Raglan. And surrounding Raglan Castle, and still evident in places today, you can see these Italianate angle bastions, which were built for additional defence of Raglan um, in the 1640s um, by the Earl of Somerset. It was the main um, royalist strongholds, certainly in South Wales. The subsequent history of the site and disposal of the possessions therein is a story on which I will not embark here, but let me close with a few preliminary pointers on where we need to go next if a definitive volume on the castle is to be the end result of future work. I know that more could be added to this list, such as a full analysis of the castle's immediate um, environs. So there's just a few bullet points. Um, so, look at the internal decoration, the upper levels, etc., the turreted moat walk, um, materials in the Beaufort Estate and the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, um, etc. So, this is a view of the moat walk, which in our tennis guidebook and in the Cadu guidebook you'll see dates to the, to the 15th century. But looking at the masonry, etc., it seems to be more likely to be part of the, the garden landscape features of the third and fourth earls uh, of, um, of Somerset, probably around about six, 1600. And I mentioned Thornbury Castle, this is Thornbury Castle in Gloucestershire. <coughs> and you'll notice similarities built in the 1520s uh, before the Duke of Buckingham was executed by Henry VIII uh, for being uh, bigger than his boots should allow. So com comparing, the great, comparing the Great Tower at Thornbury and Raglan and the, in the outer court, the unfinished outer court, you'll notice there are some porthole gun ports very similar to, to Raglan's. Uh, and this is just across the, the Severn from, um, from Mummershire. Raglan Castle still holds some surprises. If you manage to ever get into, onto the first floor of the Great Gatehouse and go and stand in the fireplace and look up the chimney, you'll see this reused grey slab um, inserted. It's, it, it survives the full length. It's beginning to flake a bit, uh, but obviously reused. But when it was inserted as the lintel for this fireplace, um, we, d we don't know. I first gave the bulk of this talk to a conference at the Beaufort Arms Hotel in Raglan where there was a day conference in memory of the late Rick Turner, one of the finest inspectors of ancient monuments um, that we've seen, uh, and not just in, in Cadu, who was very keen to develop work at Raglan and had been undertaking a certain amount of excavation. And the idea um, of, of developing the study of Raglan was to lead to a logiston style volume like we've seen with Rick's volume with Andy Johnson on, on um, Chepstow Castle and of course Ron Shoesmith and Andy jo Johnson's volume here on, on Ludlow Castle. Um, I think that is still at the back of people's mind that we need to do further work on, 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 on all, all aspects, etc. And one of the mysteries I mentioned, um, shown here on my last slide, um, is one side of the kitchen tower, which is not so reasonably clear, but here it is <coughs> the lovely fine ashlar stonework of the kitchen tower has re been replaced by brickwork um, and there's a large ramp leading up to this side of the kitchen tower and that never has been fully explained but at the weekend of the conference Paul Drury, the architectural historian then president of the Society of Antiquaries um, went and had a look around Raglan itself and sent me a very detailed email and, and he's been studying various houses of this period, such as um, Bolsover and others, and he came up with the idea that this was a, a brick and timber annex to the kitchen tower to provide further pantry or kitchen space, um, accessed by this ramp on the outside of the, of the service range here. Um, and, and so, as you can see, hopefully, I know Bill Zajac in the audience here of Cadu and others, um, such as Will Davis are really keen uh, that we further some, 
some solid academic work at, at Bragdon, um, and hopefully, maybe sometime in the future, it'll end up with um, a volume comparable to the excellent Ludlow and Chepso volumes. Thank you very much. Are there any questions uh, for, for John or indeed um, for Andy from uh, Andy's talk this morning? Um, it's always struck me that the, uh, John, well, yeah. <laughs> James, um, it's always struck me that the kitchen is rather small at Rackham. It's a tiny little uh, towered kitchen in comparison to, say, your beloved Ashby, for example, which has a vast, technologically equipped kitchen. For a household of this standard at this period in time, do you have any sort of comment on that? Well, I think what you, partly because of the Somerset rebuilding of the sort, as you go into the Pitchstone Court, the, the service range to the right, partly because that's been largely levelled during by the artillery of the parliamentarians. Um, and what's there is part of the Somerset rebuilding. We can't exactly know what was there, but that is no, always been known as the service range. So even though you've got the fine kitchen tower at the end, you a superb larder uh, under, underneath, that, that there, was, there was further um, um, sort of support ranges that were running up that side of the castle from the closet tower downwards. Um, <coughs> quite extensive range, you know, a wide range. And then there also you, you've got the, the buttery and pantry um, running from the kitchen tower towards the, well certainly from the pantry, running towards the, the spine of the, of the castle with the hall, etc. And then you've got the, the, the buttery um, down in the basement and under what is now the, the long gallery, um, which is largely, I suppose, um, 16th century, but it, it may have simply replaced what was there of, of Herbert's re rebuilding. So I, I think don't be fooled just by um, the kitchen tower. I think the thing about, about the kitchen tower that has always impressed me is not so much the facilities down below, it's what's above. You've got two superb bedsit rooms with some of the best windows in Raglan and fireplaces, yet these, this is sitting on top of the, the, the kitchen range. Okay, superb heating coming out from the, the fireplaces when used, um, but that tower was meant to be a superb feature in the landscape rather than just providing the basic food amenities, etc. But I think that there were a lot of other support ranges, not just that tower, James. Thank you very much. <coughs> Clive, one second. Um, am I louder now? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, yeah. very good. Um, <coughs> Rifle Castle under the Worcesters was um, a centre for this great earl to sort of or dominate, if not dominate, certainly be the axis for a famous phrase around which the Welsh gentry of South East Wales could revolve. So it was an important centre of power and a big cultural centre and royal centre. Was, <coughs> was there therefore any attempt by the Worcesters, soon to be both of us, after 1660, to repair Ragland, to make it habitable again? Somewhere, and I was, I was, I could have sworn that I came across the. If you look at Howard Colvin's Dictionary of Architects, um, which a new edition has come out, um, I did search through it to see whether there was anything on Ragland in, in the index. Then, but many years ago, and I kicked myself for never noting this down, I came across a reference in one of the um, descriptions of a particular mason or architect or plasterer that they, the Beauforts had come up with an idea of rebuilding Raglan Castle. Now, whether that was when um, they stopped the, what, the person who was called the Grand Dilapidator, who was removing all the flagstones and the, the Newell's trades for the staircases and to make it more of a, a tourist attraction, whether it was then or whether it was slightly in the post-restoration period, I don't know. I've, I've checked the index again. I've even started going through reading the dictionary page by page and then and sort of gave up. Um, normally with something like that, I photocopy the page and it goes into my extensive Raglan file. But um, there's certainly, I'm sure that I'm not imagining it. There was some proposal which was just a, a pipe dream, basically. Um, so, so there was Badminton House that they concentrated on. 
um, the center of great power and the bardic side of things and the, the praise poems, the library, etc., very much owes itself to the to the Herbert phase of the mid 16th, uh, 15th century, but continued by the Somerset family, who are proud of this connection um, with the Herberts. Um, and one of the great cultural losses in Wales was the, even though I'm a great supporter of Thomas Fairfax and Parliament in the Civil War, one of the great um, losses of the Civil War period is the library and the contents of. Um, I mean, there's meant to be a chair, a fine chair. In, in St. Fagan's National History Museum, which is said to have come um, from Raglan, I bought two leaves of a French um, Psalter, um, which had a note with it, no provenance, but it is said to have come from a manuscript that was at Raglan Castle. It only cost my library a few, a few pounds, and it was just worth getting because of that, that connection. Um, but um, you know, there are bits and pieces around, certainly at badminton, um, um, but as I said, you know, a lot of the pictures um, of the earls seem to be survived and still on display at Badminton. So they may have been removed to Troy House in Monmouth uh, before going on to, on, on to, on to Badminton. Troy House also being um, a, a Worcester home. Uh, Clive, are there any questions? There's no, no questions on the, uh, on the chat from people at home. Okay, I think we'll uh, move on to the next speaker. Um,